you guys for joining us for Zeiss Conversations. I'm Matthew Duclos. We're joined by Jack Sherman. Uh, we're going to talk mostly about nanoprimes, but I want to start by going into kind of your history and how you got into cinematography. Kind of the cliche, you know, what brought you into this, this game? Sure. Um, I mean, obviously, like, always really just loving movies. Um, but then being able to make movies, I, uh, I grew up at a whitewater rafting company, and my job was to kayak down ahead of the rafts, film them coming down, and then go back and edit together, you know, like a rafting video of the day. But then in the winter, when there was no rafting, we had all the equipment, like VHS to VHS decks and VHS cams. And so we just started making movies, me and my brothers and our friends. And um, that was the beginning of it. And then uh, as far as going into it as a career, just kind of got out of high school and took a year and needed to do something. <laughs> and like I <laughs> went to film school and luckily it stuck and been doing it ever since. What kind of equipment were you using? for the whitewater rafting. Oh man, it went, well, at first it was VHS cams and like those are so hard to get in your kayak. We had the, I had like a dry bag and we had like some things kind of like GoPros we'd experiment with where like we'd go into the, like the inputs of the camera and then run like crappy cameras up to our helmet with a tube up your back. None of that ever really worked. But uh, we had those and we had like hi um and then like mini DV came out and like then we could finally put it in a little box and like, you know, we got Final Cut and could edit on computers and that really, although the first couple of years, the computers would just die all the time and it was more of a pain than like the deck. I missed the deck to deck. Like it's kind of fun too. It's like DJing where you're going from like, you know, you're adding the music, fading it in and out and start wiping and doing like different fades and stuff. And that kind of went away to the computer editing. So. I mean, you know, I did it over probably a good 10 years, maybe, maybe okay. not that long, but technology changed a lot during that time. So yeah, so, it got smaller and went to computers in that time. So then going in through film school, uh, what was that experience? You know, what kind of equipment? I don't want to focus too much on the equipment. Obviously there's the art and the science of cinematography. Yeah. You, you need both. Uh, but it's always interesting to hear what kind of equipment people learn with. Well, that's the thing. So I went to Vancouver. I don't want to blow them up too much, but I went to Vancouver Film School <laughs> because specifically because they told me I could check out 16 mil cameras if I could get 16 mil film and shoot them, which was not true at all. But we did get to shoot a lot of 16 mil. But, you know, like from shooting all that stuff, you know, I, what I wanted to do was shoot on film, especially then this is like 2003, 2004. I just want to shoot film so bad. And that was the place that like told me I could shoot on film, um, which we did do. We had this really awesome cinematography teacher, Ricky. I can't remember his last name, um, but we did a lot of like film tests and like, you know, learn light meters and stuff like that. And they did a really good job of teaching that stuff. So that's what drew me there was to shoot on film. Okay. I was dying to. Did you get to put that experience to use? Do you shoot film now in your professional career? Yeah, I mean, honestly, like less now than back then. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in the beginning, yeah, yeah. In the beginning, it was mostly film. Um, uh, nowadays, it's a treat. But yeah, like, you know, when I can, certainly. Okay. So again, kind of focusing on the equipment. What, what do you look for in a lens when you're preparing for a project? Um, do you choose a lens based on the project? Do you have something you go to that's, you know, familiar? Uh, kind of walk us through that, yeah, that process. I'd say, um, no, I wouldn't say that I that, like have a go-to, certainly familiar, like I'll lean towards that, especially if there's a whole lot of other elements. If it's very technical, if it's a big time crunch, if there's a whole lot, then like that'll push me more towards the familiar so that there's less variables I don't know about, I'd say. But um, I'd say like, I mean, approaching a project, I mostly think of, movies that like maybe not that it reminds me of but like from the script like whatever whatever kind of inspires me or like comes to mind like um um actually alex who's here now like her music video is shooting reminded me of near dark that catherine bigelow vampire movie so just watch that again and just kind of like and then like that like maybe two or three movies and then just kind of get them in your head and like let them tumble around and like nothing no specific shots or something maybe like lighting techniques or styles, you know, or like where the lights are, but 
just kind of jumble those up and then see what comes out. Um, so usually do that and then kind of figure out what's the best thing I have available that can kind of get me in that world. Um, so your credits, you know, I'm speaking to you as a cinematographer, um, but you're also director, mm -hmm. Emmy award winning, right? Yeah. Okay. That's important. Congrats. <laughs> um, nice. <laughs> um, what does, uh, obviously when you're directing, you don't necessarily have the control that DP would have. What kind of perspective has that given you uh, when you have a DP that's in that role? Do you let them, do you give them freedom to choose their lenses? Do you have a say? Do you have an opinion? That's a good question. <laughs> no, but I'd like to. I mean, like in the past, it's been just kind of, just kind of the, the way things have gone that, uh, you know, I kind of designed the, the, the visuals pretty heavily, but, but I really love to have those experiences, you know, especially on the right thing to kind of turn it over more and like, just see what someone does. Um, I mean, I think just because of the production realities or like, you know, things needing to Certain be consistent or something constraints. Yeah. I've always sort of designed it more heavily, but, but I think that'd be really fun to, to kind of let go of that and, and focus on other things. But mm -hmm. then sometimes I really like like shooting and directing, but I find that like need a, a huge amount of pre-production time that can very hard to get, you know, to kind of plan everything with an AD usually, you know, yeah. like from both ends, from directing and DPing, um, which is just really hard to, you know, find the resources and time to do a lot of times. But that would be awesome. I would love to do a project like that sometime. Okay. Um, so obviously we're focusing, pun intended, on the nano primes mm -hmm. and the content you shot with those. Um, but have you had any experience with other Zeiss lenses prior to the nano primes? Because that's really Zeiss's newest product. Yeah. But we all know they've got a uh, hundred and something years of history. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Zeiss Super Speeds was like my go-to. Yeah, I mean, for so long, especially like back in the day, shooting on 16 mil and stuff. I was, I'd always try and get, you know, Super Speeds anytime I could. Um, and and then just going forward um, for so long, it, my go-tos would be Super Speeds or... Um, Coke S fours, which I just found out, research and Duclos helped like develop, which is so cool. Like, hey. really? Yeah, I, I just read that. I can't think of that. That precedes me. Yeah, that's my yeah, father. Yeah. <laughs> but those were kind of you know for so long the go to lenses um, for me, especially the super speeds. I mean, for for the look and practicality and everything yeah. about them, you know, the speed. Um, so yeah, I mean, those I've shot a gazillion things on over the years, and then um, the Supremes we shot. Uh, this Apple show home, the Mexico episode we shot on the Supremes. And that was the first, that's, uh, you know, the nanos being, you know, sort of similar to those. Mm -hmm. Um, I was really, really, really easy to intercut. Those. Yeah. yeah it was easy to intercut and very similar. Like, um, and that was the, that was the most, that was the first time I shot the Supremes and, mm -hmm. uh, really loved them too. Nice. So then going up to your most recent project, uh, and I keep I have the name in my head as something completely different. Yeah, yeah. Because it one just of those rings, tiles, but, man. We but, regret to inform you. Regret to inform you. I know it's like a bad news. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, very interesting. Uh, how did that come about? How did choosing the nano primes come about? Or I guess even farther back, did you choose them? Is it just a, a timing thing? Yeah. Walk well, you know, that. I mean, they were brand new, so I had, didn't get the chance to shoot them before. But I had shot the Supremes, and I knew they were similar and I really like the Supremes, especially for this look. Um, also being full frame, um, kind of like some of the some of the characteristics of this film, especially like half of it's in the small room. Mm. Um, Is that on Burano? Yes, okay. on the Burano, yeah. And so I really wanted to shoot full frame. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, the Nanos had, you know, were just coming out and like knowing they were similar to Supremes, um, it just sounded like a perfect fit. So, yeah. yeah. It's kind of that, it's almost like an homage to the Super Speeds. You know, the yeah. Supreme Primes are great, but they're yeah. very reminiscent of Master Primes, maybe yeah, yeah. Ultra Primes, and the Nanos kind of bring you back to Super Speeds. Totally. Yeah, totally. I mean, and also, you know, it was a small crew. Um, they're light, they're easy to use. Like, all those sort of practical things are really nice, too. It really helps us out a lot. So, the, the super small size, lightweight, 
you know, combining that with the Burano, you get a, a really small package. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's kind of a unique aspect of those lenses. I think that's what, what sets them apart from a lot of other full frame lenses. Yeah. Full frame lenses are not uncommon these days, but having them be that small and that lightweight, yeah. uh, it, it seemed like that had to be a benefit to you on that production. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, on anything, like, I, you know, I come from so much documentary work too. Like I'll always say it's, it's just nice. I mean, any broke who's AC for me, like I'll just wear the camera all day until someone takes it away from me, you know, or like, you know, I'm bad that way just coming from documentary. So like that kind of speed and ability to adapt and move around, I just always appreciate regardless, you know? Um, but yeah, on this, it was a small crew, small locations being able to move things around into tight spaces and move quickly was really beneficial. Um, but then, you know, knowing the similarity to the, to the Supremes and then, and then a bunch of surprise, like pleasant surprises and benefits from just the aesthetics of them. I, I just really, really liked, I loved them. So that's perfect segue into my next question. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so it's a huge question mark. Everyone always associates Zeiss with, you know, clean and uh -huh. clinical and, uh, very Zeiss, very, very, I, I hate to say the word boring because we're in Zeiss's space, uh -huh. but that's not the case. Yeah. You, know, you get tons of character, especially in some of their varieties, like the, the Radiance Primes. Uh, but what, what did you find after shooting those nano, nano primes uh, about their character? What, what did you like? What did you dislike? I mean, I've said to like a lot of my, especially doc DP buddies that like that, I, I certainly see them as a, kind of a reigning champ, oncoming reigning champ of, you know, small, compact, fast primes, which it seems like everyone's kind of chasing now, and which is really cool and great. Um, but some specific things uh, they have that many don't is, uh, there's a smoothness to them, especially in skin tones, pores, things like that, you know, like shiny, shininess, the, the kind of things you want smooth are, are well smoothed out, but they're still super sharp um, and they're fast and they have great minimum focus and they're small and like all those practical things too that are also in, you know, affect the image. Um, but I think that, I think it's, I think if I was, I think it's a great lens set I'd want to own for those reasons, you know, because it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it clinical at all, actually, because I actually found like the, exactly. the skin tones and the smoothness, like um, not the skin tones necessarily, the smoothness of, I don't know, gradient fall off on skin and like the color fall off like that. There was just a certain smoothness that without any filters or anything that I thought was fantastic while still maintaining sharpness. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I'd want in a lens set to own, you know, like I wouldn't want something too vintage, too funky because it's. It's just too limiting. You don't always yeah, want you're that. You're locked into that look. Right. And I, and also you can filter it. You know, like yeah. I, I did use, you know, a lot of black satin and glimmer glass on We Regret to Inform You. Okay. Filtering it is like, you know, as I wanted it filtered. But then there's also an option just to have it clean, sharp, you know, effective, but, but not sterile and not seeing, you know, a ghastly amount of pores on someone's face. Yeah. You know. I, I do feel like that stereotype that a lot of people have of Zeiss shifted mm -hmm. after the master primes, mm -hmm. you know, the super speeds, the ultra primes, the master primes, it was always everything, every step forward was an increase in sharpness and it kind of got Zeiss that reputation. Mm -hmm. um, and then CP three twos and CP threes didn't really play into that at all. But starting with the Supremes, I feel like Zeiss really started paying attention to yeah. character and it kind of broke that stereotype. Yeah. Uh, so I'm glad that you, you agree. The nanos, they're not sterile. They're not yeah. boring. Yeah. Um, uh, they have just enough character, but not so much that you're locked into it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you can you can easily filter off them without a huge degree of filter. You can give that flavor effect. But then also naked, like just the lens naked, it's still got like a really pleasing smoothness to skin, you know, to mainly to skin. That's where you know, that's where I notice it, you know, like. It's a good baseline. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's fantastic, you know, that's just a great, it's a great place to start and it's a great easy place to go, you know, like like somewhere else filtering. Um, so I can just like, I can see them as like something I'd use like in a lot of situations, you know, whereas 
the the weirder lens gets, it's just more limited, you know, or the more vintage it gets, the more limited. I wouldn't want to use it for everything. Might be perfect for something, but you know, not for everything, you know. So in summary, they're very versatile. Very versatile. Um, I don't know what focal lengths you had on that project. Did you have the full set? Yeah. Okay. Uh, where did you find yourself reaching most often, which obviously I get is very project specific, yeah. but in the case of this one, we regret to inform you, what was your go-to? What, what did you lean on most? Yeah, um, I mean the 18 way more than I would normally, really? any other 18. 18 yeah. on full frame. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> and that's the reason, you know, like part of the reason I wanted to use full frame so much was having the small room to shoot in so much of it. Just wanted to be able to obscure and manipulate the, the environment on, be able to use longer focal lengths and maintain the same frame size um, or wider focal lengths and expand that field of view be able to control field of view, control what I'm showing in the background more and like like just maximize the use of this little room. Um, but then like the 18, I, I wasn't, you know, cause didn't get to test him quick beforehand, but the 18 surprised me so much and I ended up using that way more than I expected to just cause it looks so great, you mm -hmm. know? And that's like, that's a something that wide full frame that fast too. Just gonna say that. Yeah, yeah. that fast. C15 on an 18 yeah. full frame. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I can't think of something else I've used that I could compare it to. And it was just so, yeah, it just kind of opened a lot. Like a lot of things I wasn't thinking of doing. I was like, oh, this would be cool on the 18, you know, and yeah. push it in the bed. And, I and, think uh, that's, that's the key part there. A lot of people would be like, you know, oh, 18, yeah, T13, no big deal. You get super speeds and yeah. master prime. But it's full frame. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. that much more challenging. Totally. To manufacture that and manufacture it well. Yeah. That matches the rest of the set. And also low, low distortion, even at the sides. Like it yeah. was really, just a really great image, like edge to edge. And like I just was very surprised by that. Nice. And it was so fun. That was like a lot of shots I never would have, you know, attempted without that for sure. So I know it's really difficult. This is a challenging question because it's very project specific but from what you tested what you tried with the, the nano primes what would you add to that focal length so would you oh, add a, a wider would you add something in between uh mm, something longer something longer probably yeah just for fun i mean i just wouldn't only because like I, I i like the 18 was on full frame i can't there's plenty it was very wide it was yeah. really you know i can't uh I haven't conce I don't, I don't usually think wider than that because they usually can't go wider than that, you know, as far as field of view. But I certainly never felt wanting for a wider lens. I guess longer just for just for fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something longer to whenever it becomes interesting. So even the set as it is. Oh yeah, I never felt you couldn't like achieve. yeah, I never felt like there was any like in between focal length that I was missing nice. for sure. That's awesome. That's, yeah, that says a lot about the the selection that they made for yeah yeah ranks. definitely um that's most of the questions i had prepared but uh i, I still want to talk about your other other lenses that you've used the the projects you've used them on like you mentioned the s4s what was the, what was your choice in picking those lenses and what project was that for oh man those were for just a bunch of short films and documentaries it just was it was what felt that it's what i mean the super speeds and the s4s are what were available to, you know, the budgets I had to work with also being, you know, small, compact, able to use. Um, were those just rented at the time? Always rented, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Those were always rented. Any go-to rental house you want to plug? Uh, here, Freestyle. I love Freestyle. Freestyle. Nice. Cinema Rentals, yeah, they're great. I go to them all the time. Um, and then Old Fast Glass sometimes. Great. Those are my main LA ones. Can't go wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, freestyle, I'm there. I'm there a lot. <laughs> Good focus um, charts at Old Fast Glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. DoCloseLenses.com. Yeah. And DoClose, I mean, that was a thing too, you know, the, the cine mod, because DoClose started the cine modding thing. That all, was always really this, interesting. The whole thing was started with Zeiss lenses. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting too, because like versus cine modding versus rehousing, there's like, uh, I talked with about like with some of my doc DP friends, you know, like cine modding can be so nice. My buddy has a set of Leica R's I use all the time and he's going to rehouse them. I'm like, you should, it's a good idea for, you know, the value of it. 
but I use them all the time on like little dock thing where I'm pulling my own focus. They're so sometimes small, so compact. Small, compact, and sometimes that shorter focal throw yep. is nice when you're pulling your own focus and you're going from 20 feet to 20 feet, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's kind of nice to like have that small lens, you know? So cine modding was always like such a big revolution in that kind of thing of small crew or pulling your own focus kind of things. Um, lost the question what was it again <laughs> no, we're, just, we're just chatting now yeah. yeah i could reminisce all day on cine mods that was uh that was one of the things that kind of put us on the map uh yeah and it started with uh zeiss still lenses with the the original zf prime yeah yeah uh, i use those a bunch yeah you still have them i still have them oh yep. man yeah with our mods uh yeah yeah okay i do yeah it's okay <laughs> it's not. yeah no no i had to think the 35 no, that... might not be because it's kind of it needs work. <laughs> those those yeah. lenses really, they evolved over time. It started as a ZF, then it was the ZF2, and they added more focal lengths. Then it was the Otis, and then the Milvis. And, yeah. Uh, ZF2 is the one that had. Yeah, and then even those ZF. evolved into the CP2, the CP3s. So it really was, it, it just kind of speaks to Zeiss's volume of options, yeah. uh, all the way down from, uh, I mean, I guess even you could even consider some of the, like, the Sony consumer stuff, and then going up farther and farther right. up to supreme primes uh, and it's just really nice to see the nanos fitting into that entire span of products perfectly in my opinion there's what you know there's, i'd love to ask you this the, the supremes and the nanos have a kind of quality um that really re that, that the nanos really reminded me of the supremes right off where like hitting them with light either flaring or just bleeding um and the first time when i shot the supremes it was in a dock setting almost all available light. And mm. then we regret to inform you it was very lit and stylized. But like hitting the lens with light, either bleeding or flaring, I've never uh, used lenses where it was quite so, like where you could hit the lens with the light and um, you get an effect, you get a flare or a bleed and it would be localized with a nice spill off a gradient, but the contrast would remain across the frame um, so much better than like, you know, like so many lenses, especially vintage lenses, like hit them with like a tiny bit of lens, light or bleed it. them and wash. Yeah, yeah. And decon and the way they maintain contrast across, but still able to flare them when you mm -hmm. really want to flare them or want to bleed them. That ability to control the, the contrast the, or the decon across the lens. What, what is that? Is that a, is that a coding thing? Is that a tuning thing? What, what, what All makes that quality? All of it. You can hundred percent think. Dr. Ghost, I think uh, uh, John Fowler nicknamed him. Uh, so Zeiss is, it's very intentional. Mm -hmm. So they have very sophisticated software. Um, they simulate all of that in the development of the lenses. Um, and for something like the Supreme Primes and the Nano Primes, they'll dial it in perfectly. And then the opposite side of that, something like the Supreme Radiance, right. they can use that same technique, the same method, to bring some of it back in so that you can get that washed out vintage look. Um, so yeah, a lot of it is coatings, right? Uh, but it's just the whole package, the whole optical design. Right. And in the radiance, would that be like, would that be same coating with a detune to, to like increase that flare or bleed or would it be a separate coating and detune and like a combination of the two? Um, I don't know that Zeiss admits exactly what their, right, 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 right. their solution right, there is. Yeah. A lot of it is coatings for sure. Mm -hmm. um, there might be some other detuning involved. I don't know if they would call it that. Right. I think they'd probably prefer to call it tuning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, a lot of it is the coatings for sure. Yeah. I mean, I thought that was a really remarkable thing about them. I, I love like anything, you know, the, like control anything you can control like that you know like and like add as much or as little as you want like i really appreciate um, so that's that's a good question let's say you had something like you know it's been a while since zeiss put out a new zoom uh let's see the latest would have been maybe the 20 to 100 maybe mm -hmm. is the most recent uh is that something you'd like to see from zeiss a zoom that has maybe a fourth ring for dialing in yeah, the I mean, aberration. I have not messed with any, you know, variable detuning lenses yet, but I'm super curious to. Okay. It sounds, I, I absolutely would. I mean, anything like that, you know, especially in the sense of, uh, like, if you were to own a lens set or if just, like, you know, you don't have an immense amount of testing time, like, mm. 
I love, you know, knowing what I'm starting with to, you know, yeah, to augment as I want to, you know, like, like, like knowing the base or, or like knowing, I don't know, like, I like it, that would be really great to have and be able to adjust incrementally, you know, like, I think that would be fantastic. So but I haven't messed with any of those kinds of lenses that have that variable mm -hmm. detune yet. Just like the auto blobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It sounds very cool. Yeah. I'm very curious about it. Where do you put that in reference or you know, in relation to just filters? Like you mentioned a lot of the black yeah. mist or yeah. I forget what you said, black magic or black mist? Uh, black satin I use black a lot. Satin, okay. Black satin is like the sort of subtler one I use a lot, like less halation, more just skin smoothness. And mm. then glimmer, I use a lot of glimmer glass for more halation, Same. but less. Yeah, that's my go-to, glimmer glass. Yeah, I use a lot of glimmer <laughs> glass. Um, and I'd say like, I mean, just the much more subtle fine tuned aspects of it. And also starting from a baseline, you know, starting from a baseline of an image and tuning off of that, um, I think it would just be great, especially for like preconceiving shots or, you know, like just being able to anticipate. Cause even if you can test it, sometimes, I don't know, a lens you shoot a lot is, you know, you really know, you know, like you do a bunch of projects on it. You've had in a bunch of scenarios, a bunch of rooms, a bunch of lighting situations and it's just great to really know a lens, but like to really know a lens and then be able to adjust it, have another way to adjust it aside from filtration, as far as like variable detuning, sounds great. Sounds really cool. <laughs> I'm super okay. interested in it. Well, there you go, Zeiss. Yeah. That's your, uh, <laughs> that's your next project. But who knows? I haven't tried it. Maybe it sucks. I bet it's cool. <laughs> I bet it's cool. I mean, that's really, how do you, uh, maybe it does suck, but isn't yeah, that yeah. kind of the point? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, totally. You're taking yeah. an edge off, so. Well, and those projects are fun too, where you can just kind of let it rip and shoot on some old bull X lens or something, you know, but like that ain't everything. Yeah, <laughs> you sure. don't want to do that every time for sure. That's a special scenario. I do appreciate that you said that. Cause I know a lot of people are, are, uh, they're very gung ho with vintage lenses, but, mm -hmm. uh, if there's one takeaway I've been trying to get across to people for almost a decade now, it's. There's no such thing as a bad lens. There's different lenses for different projects. Yeah. Uh, and it's not, you know, a vintage lens does not fit every project. Right, right, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, having that ability, having that clean slate to start with, like we were talking about with the nano primes, and then dialing in your look yeah. from there, Yeah. you can't go wrong. I mean, I think that's the strength. And, and like, you know, like there's like, there's also like not a lot of comparable sets that you could use in like a, in a comparable price range and comparable size and weight and just like like versatility like i mean like especially in docs like the sigma primes are very popular sydney primes and i've used those a bunch and those are great but those are very clinical and very yeah very sharp um and the the cook sp3s look very cool they're a little slow they yeah. got a short focus throw which could be fun sometimes and uh you know i love the speed pancros i'd love to use those sometime and check them out but if i was to own a set that the nanos would be the most <gasps> For the stuff I shoot, they would be the most, yeah, they're, they're, like that's what I want. Like something that's got a little bit, I wouldn't even call it character, just like smoothness, like mm -hmm. like enough smoothness where you want it, but still sharp. And they're super fast, super great minimum focus, small, like compact, like they just hit, check all those boxes where like, I feel like that's, that lens set is like a, a world that I work in and have lots of friends that work in that like, I think it will be very sought after and very like used a lot covers a lot of bases yes a lot of bases and you can make it weird as you know you can filter it up you know yeah effectively without massively filtering it you know like you can do a little bit and it'll go a long way nice um are we gonna get any questions from the audience anybody have any questions i don't think so Questions about anything. All right. <laughs> How was the food? Everyone is good? Very good. Food was excellent. There yes, we go. <laughs> All right. If there's no questions, I think uh, we'll wrap it there. Awesome. Uh, so, this was nice conversations. Uh, thanks for joining. Thanks.